we have a semicircular wire. It carries a current I and it is put on a uniform magnetic field B. We will calculate the magnetic field, the uh, magnetic force on the straight part of this loop which carries a current I to the uh, positive x direction and also we will calculate the magnetic force on the uh, semicircular part. So <clears throat> let's call these forces on part straight part as F1 and the semicircular part as F2 and let the magnetic field B be uh, expressed in uh, the unit vector notation B times J, the unit vector in the y direction and we just write down the magnetic force F1 on the straight wire by using the formula the current times the uh, length vector of the current S cross product with B, the magnetic field and I think I have to put the error of sign in here. So we will write down these vectors in explicitly. Uh, S is just uh, two times the radius of the uh, circle. The radius of the circle is given as R. Uh, and since the current is in the direction of the positive x axis, we put uh, the unit vector I in here. 2R times I is the S vector. And this will be cross product by the magnetic field B, and it's B times J, and B is constant. So next, uh, we take just the cross product of the unit vectors I and J, and this is nothing but K, and the result is 2 times the current I times the radius of the semicircle, and times the strength of the magnetic field, and the force will be in the Z direction, positive Z direction, which is uh, outward to the uh, plane of the board. Next, we will calculate the magnetic force on the curved part of this current loop and the curved part is in the shape of a circle. So for this, uh, it's we can uh, decompose this uh, semicircle part into small uh, sections which we call ds and we will write down the magnetic force on each small section ds as df right and we will express first this df2 in terms of the uh, infinitesimal length vectors of ds's and the magnetic field as in this expression i times ds cross the magnetic field is just the magnetic force on any small section of this semicircle. And for this, let's think of this um, uh, arbitrary small section ds. And from the center, we have this r vector, the radius vector. And since ds is infinitesimally small, uh, this defines an infinitesimally uh, small uh, angle through the uh, center of the uh, circle and we also measure in the polar coordinates the uh, angle of this uh, radius vector which points to the starting point of ds as theta and let me show these uh, vectors in a different picture and this is the r vector and this makes an angle theta with the x-axis and this is the infinitesimal small ds and which is uh, perpendicular to the r vector by the way this ds uh, small ds vectors sections are always perpendicular to the uh, radius vector to the center of the circle so let me decompose next this ds vector into x and y components by using the geometry, you can decompose this ds vector into x and y components as this. Since this angle is theta and this angle between r and ds is 90 degrees, you can easily figure out that ds makes an angle theta with the y-axis. And the rest is 
easy to express uh, dx x and ds y in the x and y directions by using the length of this arc because ds is just the arc length, infinitesimal arc length of the semicircle and let me write down this as a vector component dx x and ds y i and j so I will just write down ds x as the length of this infinitesimal arc length times the sine of the angle theta because ds x is uh, pointing toward the negative x axis and have, we have to put this minus sign that's why we have to put the minus sign in here so the arc length ds times sine theta and it is in the minus x direction minus i is just the x component and similarly the y component is just the arc length ds times cosine theta and j is the unit vector in the y direction so next is what is ds the arc length and we all know from geometry that any uh, section or arc of a circle is just the uh, radius times the angle that sees this arc length and this we call uh, d theta so ds can be written down as the radius of the semicircle r times d theta so let's put everything in uh, the uh, formula and since now uh, we can write ds as unit vectors and we know what b is in terms of the unit vector j so uh, when we write down explicitly all the terms we immediately see that the infinitesimal force on the infinitesimal arc length of the semicircle is nothing but this minus i the current times the strength of the magnetic field b times the radius of the semicircle times sine theta d theta and it is all in the um, z direction but since we have minus sign in here the force on the direction of the force on any section of this semicircle is, is pointing the negative z axis so next is uh, since this is just only an uh, infinitesimal uh, part of the force we have to take this integral to find the total force on the semicircle and to find the total force we just take the integral of this expression as the variable we have theta and we know that theta runs from 0 to pi right because this is a semicircle and it runs from 0 to pi and the only uh, expression which depends on theta is sine theta and when you take this integral it's easy to find the result the total force on the semicircle curved part only is nothing but minus 2 times the current i times the strength of the magnetic field times the radius of the semicircle and k is the unit vector so you just see that this result for the curved part of this loop is just the negative of this the force which is on the straight part of this loop and we all know that a closed loop uh, which is put into a uniform magnetic field experiences no net force so this is just the verification of this uh, uh, the uh, uh, result that the total force on this loop when you add is equal to zero so just verify it that by just calculating the explicitly the forces on the curved part and the straight part and adding them together we get a zero net force on any closed loop loop of current which is put in any uh, this result is true for any uh, uniform magnetic field now let's think of the case of a rectangular loop, the current loop, which is put into a region of space where there is a uniform magnetic field and the sides of the rectangular loop is given as this side B and this side A, a. and the direction of the uh, current is the counterclockwise direction and the magnetic field is in this direction which is parallel to the uh, side B and we label the parts, the sections of the uh, rectangular loop as 1, 2, 3 and 4 so the current on section 1 is to the left and the current on section 2 
is to down and the current on the section 3 is to the right and the current on the section 4 is up. So the first thing is since we know that uh, as long as we have a current flowing inside the region of space where there is a non-zero magnetic field we know that uh, there will be a force acting on the wire or the current. Um, so let's first find what the forces are on these uh, sections of the current and uh, do we have a total force on the current loop if we uh, add all the forces uh, on sections 1, 2 and 3 and 4 and we will uh, analyze this and if not uh, we will consider a second situation that if there is a torque on the loop okay so on the second picture down here you see uh, the, the rectangular loop from this side okay from the uh, side B and this the point O is uh, the half phase of uh, the side B on 3 and on this side the current is toward uh, the out of page and in this in this part in the current this 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 part is la uh, labeling the four uh, this one and it is uh, going into the page um, so we will analyze um, if there is a torque on in which direction that the, uh, the uh, current will rotate and now let's think the forces one by one firstly think the force on the section one and three but without any uh, 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 applying the uh, force equation for these parts we know that by just you know, uh, looking at the picture, the uh, magnetic field and the current on sections 1 and 3 uh, are parallel. Uh, actually, in, in section 4, they are uh, anti-parallel, and in section 3, is they are parallel. But this doesn't make any difference. The cross product of uh, the length or the current vector with the magnetic field will be zero. So that means there will be no any magnetic force on section 1 and section 3 because they are parallel. To the magnetic field, so uh, we can easily set these um, in here. The forces are zero, forces on one and three and zero because the uh, displacement vector, the current, the, the, the vector determined by the direction of the uh, currents on these sections are parallel and anti parallel to the magnetic field. So, uh, the other when you think the other um, the sections, section 2 and um, 4, uh, you, you, you can easily see that the uh, directions of the currents are perpendicular to the magnetic field. That means, in fact, we will have a maximum uh, force acting on these sections of the loop. So, uh, if you uh, want to uh, talk about the strength of these forces, you can easily uh, say that the strength will be a uh, just the current, the length of the uh, section 2 and times the strength of the magnetic field because of this simple uh, formula and we can easily uh, the, this strength of the forces for sections 2 and 4 will be equal to each other in, in strength but of course the directions will be uh, opposite because the current on this part is flowing down and on the uh, part uh, on the section 4 it's flowing up so that means the forces will be in uh, opposite directions, and this is can this can be easily seen from the from this uh, side's view of the current. So you see the F two is up and F four is. You can verify this by just uh, using your right hand and applying the right hand rule to to, to, uh, to determine the directions of the forces. So these strengths uh, of the force F two and F four is just I times a because the length of the uh, current sections are uh, a and times the strength of the magnetic field and the directions when you look at this picture uh, for f2 it's it's going to be out of the page and for f4 it's going to be into the page but for this picture f2 is up and f4 is down because we are looking to the uh, uh, loop from the side view so the question is what, do we have a net force that uh, possibly will move this current loop inside this uh, magnetic field? The answer is no, because well, there are no forces on sections one and three, and 
the forces on two and four are equal to uh, equal in magnitude, but they are uh, uh, opposite in direction. So that means the net force on the current loop is zero, and the current loop as a, a total object will not move uh, because of these magnetic forces. But what we know is uh, since if you, when you look at this point O, which passes and an axis passes through uh, the middle of this rectangle in this direction, the middle of uh, uh, the part B, the, the force F2 in this picture will try to rotate the loop in this direction, the uh, clockwise direction, and when you look at F4, again you see that F4 will also contribute in the same direction to this rotation. So when you uh, leave this loop in in case where there is no gravity, nothing else in just outer space, when there are no any other forces acting on the loop, the loop will try to rotate. Okay, whenever you apply this magnetic field, uh, the loop will rotate on this direction, and we can then talk about the torque of these forces. And torque is nothing but the force the force uh, times the force arm to the uh, axis of rotation and in our case we can easily uh, talk about the strength of this torque, the maximum torque in this position is just F2 times B over 2 and F4 times B over 2 since F2 and F4 are equal in magnitude each other and uh, they will contribute in the same direction for the torque we can calculate the uh, maximum torque in this position or in this orientation of the uh, current loop as the current I times the sides of the rectangle A times B uh, we, in fact this is nothing but the area of the current loop, the area covered by the current loop times the uh, strength of the magnetic field alright so uh, whenever you leave this current loop in this orientation there will be a maximum torque acting on right? so we can summarize this uh, magnitude of torque as the uh, of the current I times the area which is uh, determined by this current, the loop, and times the magnetic field. Well, in general, if the we put the current loop not in this direction where the uh, magnetic field B is parallel to the uh, uh, section 3, uh, not parallel but uh, makes an and makes an angle like here you see the magnetic field B is making an angle uh, uh, a non uh, non-zero angle uh, with the uh, this part of the loop or uh, let's uh, first define the area vector of this loop determined by this loop and we know that whenever there is a surface the area vector is always perpendicular to the surface and for this one for this orientation of course the area vector will be perpendicular to this uh, side of the loop and that means that the area vector has an angle which is uh, uh, other than the 90 degrees in this case uh, when the uh, uh, area of the uh, loop uh, was parallel to the magnetic field and we had uh, the uh, area vector uh, perpendicular to the uh, magnetic field but in here in any orientation, if you give any orientation that makes uh, uh, the angle between the area vector and the magnetic field as theta, let's say in general, then torque will be just I times the area of the loop times uh, B times sine of the angle between the area vector and the magnetic field, right? So, in most general case, we can, since torque is a, a vector, we can uh, finalize this result torque as the cross product of this quantity I times the area vector of the loop uh, cross product with the external magnetic field so in this position we define a new quantity, new physical quantity which we call the magnetic moment determined by this closed loop uh, For this is true for any uh, current loop if you have any current loop, it doesn't matter uh, the shape, whether it's rectangular or any irregular shape or a, a circular or uh, any uh, any shape, as long as it is closed, it is a closed uh, uh, region of space surface. Then uh, 
Uh, this current determines a magnetic moment vector, which is nothing but the uh, current flowing through this uh, loop times the area of the loop, where area, of course, will be taken as a vector. And we know that for any surface, we can define an area vector which is perpendicular to that surface. So, in general, if you have a, a loop, current loop, which has a magnetic moment uh, mu, then the torque on this loop is just given by this most general expression mu cross product with the external magnetic field. Well, this will be a similar to the case if you leave an electric dipole, remember, uh, inside the region of space where there is some electric field, non zero electric field, then for uh, the dipole, uh, the torque will, be, will result uh, because of uh, the forces acting on the plus charge and the minus charge and remember that this uh, torque was calculated by the uh, dipole moment vector of this dipole the cross product with the external electric field so it's, they are very similar uh, in fact uh, in, in the case of uh, a magnetic field and the magnetic uh, moment uh, again the torque is given by this cross product so mu, which is I times the area vector, is a new property, new uh, physical quantity that we mostly use in physics, uh, which we call the magnetic moment, and this is true for any closed current. Okay, uh, any closed current uh, determines it is determ uh, determines a physical quantity which we call the magnetic moment. So, uh, just like in the case of a uh, dipole in an electric field, a charged dipole, electric charge dipole, uh, determines a electric potential, right? Because whenever you leave an electric dipole inside an electric field, the dipole will uh, try to align with the direction of the electric field. And if you uh, change this alignment, then uh, the dipole will try to uh, go to this uh, minimum energy case where we define the uh, potential energy of a dipole as minus dipole vector dot with the electric field. So just like this, uh, the case of a, a magnetic moment inside a, a magnetic field, the region of space where there is a non-zero magnetic field, it defines a magnetic potential energy which is determined by this dot product, dot product between the magnetic moment and the external magnetic field. Of course we have a minus sign because uh, in, just in the case where this uh, magnetic moment vector uh, aligns itself with the uh, magnetic field, the system will be in the uh, smallest uh, or um, uh, smallest uh, energy, and whenever uh, you uh, misalign from this smallest energy, the uh, magnetic moment or the current loop will try to align itself so that it can have a minimum energy. Right, so. Now, uh, in this uh, problem, uh, we can summarize what we have is whenever you put a current loop which has a magnetic moment inside an electric, uh, uh, so, sorry, inside a, a region of space where there is a non-zero magnetic field, uh, the torque on this magnetic dipole is just mu cross B, and the magnetic energy of this loop is just minus the magnetic moment vector dot product with the external magnetic field. Let's think of a charge and it is in circular motion circulating a, a ring of radius r at a constant speed and the charge has the in general the charge q and the speed is constant and you will find uh, the magnetic moment of this circulating charge. So to find the magnetic moment, first we have to define what the current this circulating charge uh, defines, right? So, and we will use the definition of the current. The current is defined the charge uh, passing through a point uh, per unit time, and in our case, our charge is Q and the time uh, required to pass from the initial point at any point you can take the initial point uh, as a, the capital T which we call the period of uh, 
the uniform circular motion. The, this is something we know from our um, lectures in the uh, first semester. And for any um, uniform circular motion, this capital T refers to the period of the motion. That means it is the time required to make one complete revolution, right? So, and this period can be easily find by the total distance in, part, in one revolution divided by the speed. So it's very easy. And as we put all things together in the definition of the current, then we can have the current defined, defined by this circulating charge is the charge Q times the speed of the um, charge object and divided by 2 pi r. And since this uniform circular motion also defines the angular velocity, we can write uh, this current in terms of the angular velocity as Q times the angular velocity omega divided by 2 pi because the angular velocity and the linear speed, uh, the tangential speed of the circular motion are related to each other by omega is equal to V divided by R. So this is uh, the current and of course um, if we have a current uh, in the shape of a circle then uh, this defines the area. The area is just nothing but the uh, area defined by this ring and it is just a pi r square because in order to define the magnetic moment we also need uh, the area which is enclosed by the current and we can write down the expression for the magnetic moment as I times A. A is the area vector of the uh, ring. Of course, the magnitude of the A is the area of the uh, uh, this circular region. And what about the direction? Direction is, uh, by using the right-hand rule, the direction will be uh, out of the page, right? Because when you put your four fingers in the direction of the velocity, then your thumb uh, will show up the direction of your area vector. All right, so the magnitude is pi r square, and when everything is put all together, we can have the magnetic moment defined by a circulating charge is one half the charge Q times the speed of the uh, charge times the radius of its uh, circulating ring. Well, it is in general. Uh, this is the convention that to uh, uh, denote any uh, uh, circulating charge uh, magnetic moment in terms of its angular momentum. So if you want to write down this magnetic moment in terms of the angular momentum defined by this circulating charge, we can have, since the angular momentum is for a circula uh, circular motion is m times v times r, and we can put also this uh, angular momentum into the expression and we can get the uh, magnetic moment as Q divided by 2m times the angular momentum. So in terms of the angular momentum also we can um, denote, we can uh, define the magnetic moment and the magnetic moment in that case uh, can be written as a proportional vector to the uh, uh, angular momentum of the circulating charge and this proportionality constant in physics has a very special name. It is called the gyromagnetic ratio. So, uh, whether you have a particle which is spinning or any uh, charge which is circulating, then uh, the magnetic moment will be proportional to the uh, angular momentum defined by the system. And this proportionality constant is always called the gyromagnetic ratio. Let's think of a disk which is rotating around an axis, let's call this axis as Z, and it is a charged disk, and the charge is uniformly distributed over the uh, surface of the disk. And the question is, uh, we have to define or we have to determine the magnetic moment by this uniformly rotating disk. Uh, well. You can ask why, because uh, since we have a charge and the charge is in motion on the surface, uh, 
and any uh, charge which is in motion defines a current and we know that uh, the current, a rotating current uh, can define a, a current loop and this in turn will define the magnetic moment of the system so uh, which, which the, with the given parameters of the problem omega is the angular uh, speed of this disk, rotating disk and it is constant and also we call the sigma as the surface charge density of the disk and the radius of the disk is given by the capital R well uh, next is of course we have to define the current of this rotating disk but we can always um, uh, see this rotating disk as the sum of rings right sum of rings uh, which have different radius uh, um, uh, uh, changing from um, zero a point to a radius r and when we define the current by these infinitesimally uh, thin uh, rings and add them all we will find the total current defined by this um, rotating disk in turn we will define the total magnetic moment defined by this rotating charge okay so we can then uh, define these current rings while well, we uh, define these current rings as uh, having the radiuses which are changing from 0 to r and they have the thickness of dr and we can easily find the uh, total charge on these rings and also we know that the rotating what the rotating speed is so we can in turn define the current so um, the idea is to start with uh, the infinitesimal uh, pieces of uh, magnetic moments of these infinitesimal thickness uh, rings and then add them all so let's define uh, this infinitesimal uh, sm infinitesimally small the magnetic moment which are uh, which is created by these rotating charge uh, rings as uh, di times a here uh, the next thing is of course we have to find this infinitesimal uh, currents defined by these rings right so of course we have to multiply this by the area which is enclosed by this ring uh, to find the magnetic moment so so it is easy to find and uh, to put this area uh, in terms of the radius of these rings and just pi r square so what is di then well what is di di is the charge which is uh, rotating right and which is on this uh, shaded region of the disk which is in, in thickness of dr because in in the direction of radius and let's define this as uh, dq because to the total charge on this ring which has a thickness dr uh, as dq and it will be divided by the period of this rotation because the, the definition of the current is the total charge uh, uh, total charge uh, divided by the time so this time of course will be in the time of the rotation right and the next is what is this dq and since we are given what the charge density is and uh, if we can calculate the area of this infinitesimally uh, thin rings then we can find, uh, multiplying this area by the charge density, we can find dq, right? So the dq, uh, by the way, uh, t is uh, 2 pi divided by omega, and this is uh, from the uh, uniform rotational motion, it's very easy. And this, putting this aside, let's uh, express then what dq is. dq is uh, sig uh, the sigma times, the total area is the thickness of this ring times the circumference, that's very easy and we will multiply the uh, charge density by 2 pi r times dr and we will divide it by the period of the rotating uh, motion so it's 2 pi divided by omega so once we express this di then we can put this in turn into this expression of uh, d mu which is the infinitesimal um, uh, magnetic moment of these rings and we will get uh, well, uh, first let's let's express the what this di is by just simplifying this equation, right? Uh, 
So these two pi's will cancel out and we can put this omega into the denominator and sigma times omega times r times dr is di, all right? So next is, let's put this uh, into the expression of d mu and d mu is just sigma omega r dr times pi r square, all right? And if we further simplify this expression, this will depend on the radius cube, right? Pi sigma omega r cube and dr. So next is, of course, uh, taking the integral, right? Because this is the infinitesimal magnetic moment, and to find the total magnetic moment, we have to integrate this. So if you put this term of d mu inside the integral, it is easy that the, since the, vari uh, 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 the variable inside the integral is r, smaller, and we know uh, uh, the limits of r because it's uh, changing from 0, to capital R, and when you take this integral, it's very easy, 1 over 4 pi sigma omega times R to the 4, okay? So this is the uh, total magnetic moment defined by this rotating disk, which has a charge density sigma, and the rotation uh, angular speed is just omega. All right, so next, uh, of course, we have, since uh, mu, or uh, the magnetic moment, is a vector. The vector will be in the direction of the uh, rotational uh, uh, angular velocity of this rotating disk. So as a vector, mu is nothing but 1, one over 4 pi sigma uh, capital R to the 4 omega as a vector. And next, uh, we will express, because it is uh, very conventional that to express the rotating objects the magnetic moments uh, defined by the rotating objects in terms of their angular momentum. So, uh, since the disk is rotating at a certain angular uh, velocity, which is a constant, then we can find uh, what the angular momentum of this disk. It is nothing but, we know from, well, uh, first of all, the total charge is, uh, let's put the total charge as sigma pi r square because the area of the disk is uh, pi r square. And next, uh, let's express the angular momentum of this rotating disk, and we know from the mechanics of rotating objects, the angular momentum is nothing but the moment of inertia of this rotating disk times the angular velocity. So, in terms of the total charge and in terms of the angular momentum, let's try to express what this magnetic moment is, and you will see that easily the magnetic moment can be written as this total charge divided by 2 times the mass of the disk times the angular momentum. And this is always true, right? This is always true for whether this rotating object is a disk, a ring, or any point particle, doesn't matter. The uh, moment of uh, dipole moment of the system is always equal to its angular momentum times its total charge divided by its total mass, uh, twice of the total mass. So this ratio, Q, the total charge of the system or the object, divided by twice of its mass, is called in physics the gyromagnetic ratio. And this is always true that uh, for any uniformly uh, rotating objects which has some charge, and the uh, magnetic moment can always be expressed as the total charge divided by twice the mass times the angular momentum of the system. And we will see uh, another example of this. We will uh, see that any circulating point charge, which is in the uniform circular motion, the magnetic moment can also expressed in terms of its total charge divided by the twice of the mass times its angular momentum. Now we will consider a special motion of a charged particle inside a region of space where there is a uniform magnetic field. Imagine we have a charged particle which has a plus charge Q and it is moving in space with a constant velocity. And what happens, the question is what happens right after it enters into a region of space where the magnetic field is perpendicular to the uh, velocity, as you see in this picture to the right, the velocity is to, to the right, and the magnetic field is into the page. And it is uniform in every uh, 
point of this region of space. So right after it enters into this region of space, because of the force acting on the charged particle which has a non-zero velocity, uh, there will be a force which will be uh, always perpendicular to the velocity vector of the particle. And this force is, you know, determined by the charge of the particle, uh, the velocity of the particle, cross product with the magnetic field. So when you think of this cross product of the uh, velocity, V, the velocity vector to the right, with the magnetic field vector which is into the page, you can easily figure out that the magnetic force will be in this direction, which is, in this picture, upward direction. And since the force is acting perpendicular to the velocity, this force will not change the speed of the particle, right? Because as long as the force acting on a particle, on an uh, object, uh, which is perpendicular to its motion, it will, the force will not change its kinetic energy. So what happens is this force will change the direction of the motion and it will change the direction of the velocity vector, of course. And whenever the direction of the motion of the particle is changed a little bit, again, because of this property of the force, in V cross B, the force will again be perpendicular to the velocity vector. And the force will always, in fact, be perpendicular to the velocity vector. And that's because of the um, uh, formula or um, the quantity of the magnetic force, which depends on V cross B. And since B is not changing, it is uniform everywhere, and it is always into the page, and by the way, V is changing because of the magnetic force, but uh, for example, at this position, the uh, velocity vector is upward, and when the velocity vector is upward, when you take the cross product V cross this B into the page, the force will be toward left. And this will continue uh, where the magnetic force will always be perpendicular to the direction of the motion, and this will define a, a new type of motion for the particle, which is initially a linear motion, and it will put the particle into a special kind of motion, which is a circular motion with constant speed, right? Because uh, the uniform circular motion is always keeping its speed at constant, and it defines a circle if a fixed radius r. So, that means now the particle will be in a uniform circular motion and the force that defines this circular motion will be magnetic force, Fb, and we can easily uh, find our relation between the, uh, the force, the, uh, which is radial in direction, right? And this is nothing but the uh, magnetic force. And we can always uh, apply the Newton's second law in the radial direction. And because of the nature of the uh, motion, this will be equal to uh, the mass of the particle times the radial acceleration. So we have a, a radial acceleration because the although the speed of the particle is not changed, but the uh, direction of the velocity is changing, that defines a, a acceleration and acceleration is always the change of um, velocity the, the time change of rate of the velocity vector so we can always uh, con uh, write down this Newton's second law in the radial, radial direction in this form so what is the force in the radial direction it is nothing but the magnetic force and the magnetic force the strength of the magnetic force is determined by the strength of the charge of the particle and it is the speed and also it, it is defined by the strength of the magnetic field and in fact this uh, strength of the magnetic force will be equal to m times the radial acceleration but the radial acceleration for a uniform circular motion is nothing but v square over r right
um, R is fixed, it's, it's not changing for a uniform circular motion and this m times the radial acceleration is nothing but uh, that we have seen before in the last semester it is nothing but the mass times v squared divided by r so from this equation in fact as long as we know what the mass of the particle is and what the charge is what the initial speed is and what the uh, strength of the magnetic field we can in fact uh, predict the radius of its uh, uniform circular motion. So if you solve for the radius you will get this simple expression for the radius it is nothing but the mass of the particle times its speed and divided by the charge of the particle times the strength of the magnetic field. Since it is a uniform circular motion we know that for every uniform circular motion we can define the angular speed of the uh, motion and it is the angular speed is nothing but its linear speed divided by the radius of the uniform circular motion and since we already get this radius information from the previous expression we can find this angular speed of the particle in terms of the charge of the particle the strength of the magnetic field in the region and the mass of the particle it is q times v divided by mass and this has a special term the special name which we call the cyclotron frequency okay so this is the the uh, angular speed of the this uh, uniform circular motion and this angular speed is called as the cyclotron frequency of this charged particle which is in uniform circular motion in a constant magnetic field so from this expression, of course, we can also find the period of the motion. The period is the time required to make this uh, one revolution of this uh, particle in this uh, circular path. And it is just 2 pi times r divided by v. And it is uh, there is another expression in terms of this... Uh, angular speed or the second cyclotron frequency it is 2 pi divided by omega but we can always express omega in terms of uh, the charge the magnetic field and the mass of the particle so we can express the period of this special type of motion as 2 pi times the mass divided by q the charge of the particle times the uh, strength of the magnetic field